Welcome to another episode of Called Bank Sports. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the Jazz. Well, obviously we talk about the Jazz every episode, but we, <laughs> we want to talk about what we saw out of the first round and what, what we're looking for the second round, some key things uh, to look for there. One thing that I, I have pulled up here on, on my other monitor is the individual player stats for the Jazz from the first round. Um, they're like... Watching the Jazz, like it felt like there were some times that were too close for comfort, and it felt like the Jazz really weren't playing at their best. But really taking a step back and looking at how each player played, like there have been some impressive performances from the Jazz. Obviously, let's start with Mitchell. Uh, he's averaging 28.5 points per game in the playoffs, which that's through four games, like not crazy impressive yet, but. I'm, and that's like he kind of eased into that. He he felt like he wasn't a hundred percent. So that's good news for the Jazz. That's uh, with him playing twenty five minutes his game for his first game back. Yeah, that's so he insane. put up he put up twenty five minutes, but he's been playing limited minutes in part because the Jazz are concerned about easing him back into it. So that's part of the reason why the numbers he's putting up are just so unbelievable this off season. And yeah, and. We're going to talk more about Mike Conley in a second, so I'll, I'll I'll push him off until later. But as a team, like the Jazz are averaging, if you round up, 17 three-pointers made every game. And as a team, they're shooting, if you round up, 41% from the three, which is incredible. Uh, the only two players, like I, I kind of quiz Nate on, who he thought the two <laughs> players who were shooting under 40% is. And I'm guessing you can guess it as well. So I'll ramble for a little bit so you can think about it and guess. But uh, Jordan players, Clarkson and Joe Ingles. Hopefully yeah, I didn't spoil which, that for anyone. Yeah, hopefully you had enough time with my rambling to, to <laughs> either pause the video or think about that for yourself. Um, but still, like, that's incredible. Obviously, Jordan Clarkson's on a like sh- in a shooting slump. But... If we can see that kind that level of shooting from the Jazz throughout the playoffs, I really, really, really like our chances. Um, so, like, and I thought that was one of the big things moving forward uh, to to know if the Jazz were going to succeed in the playoffs. But yeah, I, I mentioned we were going to talk about Conley, and I, I know I'm kind of rambling here, but. And we want to talk about his injury, but before we hop into that, I just want to show off how good he's been playing in the playoffs. Um, because normally in this season, like you kind of expected uh, around like 15 to 17 points, which he's been giving us. He's been averaging 17 in the playoffs. And you kind of expect, I don't know, five or six assists and a, uh, two, maybe three rebounds. Uh, but he's been awesome at facilitating the offense. He's been getting 8.6 assists. With a 5.4 assist to turnover ratio, which is uh, incredible. Um, and, and then he's been giving us his 17 points and four rebounds. So, like, with that being said, Mike Conley, if he didn't play, we probably wouldn't have won in five uh, in that first series. So he's going to be a big deal for series two. What are your thoughts about the injury and his availability uh, starting in round two? Oh, um. See, so this is kind of what I've heard. And um, I've heard a lot of people just try to like be really optimistic about it. And he said, oh, it's just a mild strain. But Mike Conley isn't going to come out and say he's going to be out for two weeks. And while I do expect him to play because it's the playoffs, I think the voice of the Jazz, David Locke, has said it the best. Like, there is no reason to believe that this is not exactly the same thing that has happened in the past that has put Conley out for two weeks plus. So, so I'm kind of really concerned, like since there was a lot of discussion, like, Oh, well the jazz were up so much. Did he just go back to the locker room? Because why risk it? But that's not really what happened. If you go back and watch the game, like he came off the court and immediately went back to the locker room. He didn't go over and talk to Quinn and say, Hey coach, like, just kind of my hamstrings feeling a tiny bit off. Can we just rest me for the rest of the game? No, he came off the court and went back to the locker room. And I believe he said in his interview that he tweaked it a tiny bit and then tried to play through it, which 
I totally get the competitive mentality that he was trying to go with, especially in the playoffs, but we didn't need Mike to win that game. Um, the Grizzlies were just tired after frankly, what they've been through trying to get to the playoffs. Um, and really we saw a broken Grizzlies team on Wednesday and even a broken, broken Grizzlies team is still competitive with a lot of heart, but the jazz came out, hit those threes. And so we didn't need Mike as much. And, but I do, like you said, we need him to win in the second round, especially if we end up playing um, no disrespect to the Mavericks, especially if we end up playing the Clippers. So I am um, concerned about where he's going to be. And while I do expect him to play because it is mild and not too bad, my bigger concern is, you know, that there's a reason when this has happened in the past, he's taken significant time off. It's to not risk further injury. So I I'm really worried about him, you know, hurting himself more in the second round and not being available for um, the rest of the playoffs, possibly depending on how far the jazz make it. Yeah. That's a rough situation because like whether we play the Mavs or the Clippers, which at this point when we're recording this video, we don't know we're still waiting for game seven. Um, But we're going to need my colleague to get through that series. You mentioned that it's probably going to be a little bit easier to get, get through the Mavs without Conley, but uh, it'd be tough. It's still, still hard. And, yeah. And so it's like, it's like if, if he's hurt, but he's like, he's like 90% like decent risk of re injury. But so like, do you rest him through a majority of the second round risking that you lose in the second round because he's gone, which I, I don't think we will. It will just be a lot tougher with him. Yeah. Or do you play him and like try to get out of the second round as fast as possible, hopefully giving him some time in between series again to, uh, to rest up and heal. I don't know. That's a tough situation in the playoffs because like you want to focus on the future, especially if you think you can win the championship, but you have to win this round in order to get to the championship. So yeah, I, but the, he's day to day, so I don't think he'll miss a ma- a major portion of round two if he misses any games at all. No, and but I think so. I think the playoffs is obviously the question everybody's concerned about now because, frankly, if you told me that we wouldn't have Mike Conley ever again in a Jazz uniform, but we won the finals this year, I, I I'd take that. Looking at it though is. He's had this recurring hamstring issue since coming to Utah and since he tweaked it the first time. This isn't getting better, and Mike Conley isn't getting any younger. So what does it mean for this playoffs is obviously the relevant question right now. But what does this mean for the future of Mike Conley, not just as a jazz man, but in the NBA? And so that those are really my thoughts on Mike Conley overall. Uh, that's a good point. And... Um, yeah, but that will be something interesting. And I'm sure we'll go into that more as we see this injury play out. And as as after the playoffs in the off season, like looking at how many years he has under contract and, and trying to get a feel. I believe he's a free agent now. So this was, this is his last year. Yeah. He said that he will come back to Utah. Um, now you do have players like Kyrie Irving who have said that they'll go back to Boston. I but personally you, you can't compare Kyrie and Mike Conley. <laughs> yeah, I, I personally trust people. Mike Conley's word a bit more, but he could be very expensive. And I mean, he's definitely earned his cash this year. So it'll be an interesting Mike Conley saga. Hopefully there's no more drama in the playoffs and he can just go out there and perform at the, his best level. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but so and, and looking forward to round two, Mike Conley, or no Mike Conley. We're going to be playing the Mavs or the Clippers. And we have, like, it, it was a crazy game last night. The Mavs were close into it, and then Kawhi went crazy. Um, I, I I tuned in for just the last few minutes. Oh, and, the, the worst few minutes? Yeah. And it was, like, Kawhi was really good at getting Luka switched on to him, which obviously Kawhi loves that matchup. Yeah, but it wasn't like Luca was playing bad defense. It was just Kawhi who was hitting his shots. Um, Kawhi's a monster. I know, but looking forward, we have Game Seven in LA. The Clippers have not won a game in Los Angeles um, this playoff series, but it's Game Seven, so it's kind of a coin toss. I know Vegas has 
the Clippers favorited by six and a half points. So I think this will be an interesting game. What do you anticipate out of this? And, and what do you want to happen for the Jazz? So it's kind of a tale of two sides, right? Like the Clippers have all the, has really been atrocious this series. Like even when the Mavs have won games and Luke has been dominant doing it. And I don't want to take any, no disrespect to the Mavericks at all. The Clippers have just been bad in those games. So looking at how bad the Clippers have been, I would prefer to play the Clippers. Um, But when I compare trying to stop Luca and only having to stop him, um, even though the Mavs do have a great offense around him, he is definitely the facilitator. And we've seen that how he goes, the Mavs go. Um, I am much more confident in being able to stop the Jazz being able to stop him than I am in the Jazz being able to consistently stop Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. And even though Kawhi and Paul have been struggling this series, when you look at it, they're still both superstars who can take the ball in their hands and do absolutely amazing things. And Luka can do it as well, but it's the tale of 1v2. Luka's the better player, but having two amazing players on your team just makes it even harder for the Jazz to stop them. And if Kawhi's having a bad game, that's great for the Jazz. But then, let's say Paul George has a great game, and Kawhi's able to have that bad game. Versus if Luka has a bad game, then the Mavs lose. I I think you're forgetting about one piece that the Mavs have that... <laughs> Uh, not you, Seth you Curry. You can't forget about Boban. But, I mean, He's, I do love Boban, but I really don't think that's going to greatly impact Rudy Gobert on either end of the court. Um, he's obviously a great guy, um, really big, and that definitely helps him, but he does have a lot of body control and plays with a lot of heart. Like, he's not just a big guy put out on the floor, but Rudy Gobert is the best defensive yeah. center. <laughs> You know, and, in the and, league right now, arguably in NBA history. So, and the Clippers don't have a really tall guy like Gobert. Yeah. And so, when, when Boban's been out on the floor, it's been kind of funny to watch because of how easily he gets rebounds, how easily he dunks on people. So I don't know how tall he is, but he's he's definitely way taller than Gobert. But Gobert's much taller than anyone the Clippers have. So, yeah, I don't think that would work as well against the Jazz as like it's working against the Clippers. Well. We talk. I mean, I talked a lot about offense because that's what the NBA playoffs have been. But also, um, spoiler alert for all the Mavs fan out there, Mavs fans out there, the uh, Mavs don't play defense. That that is not something that they're known for. They have a bad defensive team. They tried to um, make some adjustments by trading Seth Curry for um, Richardson. First name just left my brain. But frankly, I'd be more terrified about playing the Mavs if they still had Seth Curry if they still had just an elite three point shooter. So I, that's part of the reason is like I, the Clippers have shown that they're able to play really good defense on the jazz. And I believe that the Mavericks play a drop big, especially when they have Boban on the court who they're going to have to because Rudy's on the court, which is the defense. The jazz are the most successful against um, offensively. Yeah. And, and so in this game seven, so I, I agree with you on pretty much every point you've made. Uh, I would much rather see the Jazz play the Mavs. I think that's an easier matchup for the Jazz. Um, seeing how the Clippers are playing, though, if the Clippers come and give us their A-plus game, that's going to be a really tough series. But I don't think that's what we're going to see from the Clippers if they make it out. Um, they haven't shown, like, every time, every game that we've seen from the Clippers in the playoffs with the uh, Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, we've never seen their A-plus game. Um, so... There's also that to consider. Even with that considering, I'd rather play the Mavericks because, like you said, it's all Luka. And I don't think, like, if Luka's not on the court, the offense isn't going anywhere. And we made the Jazz probably can't stop Luka, but Luka's not going to beat the Jazz single handedly. No, Um, he's not. And the scary thing about the Clippers is just what if they do get back into form? Which like yeah. could happen, especially when you get um they have some injured players right now. Like if you get I believe Ibaka back for the Clippers, that would be um, huge. That would be huge. Like he's not obviously like you know Golden State prime Ibaka. I don't know if he was ever prime in Golden nah, State, but it's well, not. Did prime he ever play for Ibaka. Golden State? Maybe he, I'm mixing him up. He played with. for the Thunder, the Magic, and the Raptors, and now he's okay. on the Clippers. I, I'm mixing him up with someone then, but. 
Like he's not he's not in his prime, obviously, but he's still a, like a good player and a good defender. So no, it's definitely uh, like concerning for him, concerning not um just concerning that what if I think we're seeing the best Mavs right now, but what happens if we see the best Clippers? It is basically what I'm getting at after all yeah. my ramblings. And and with that being said, who do you think will win Game Seven? Who do I? <sighs> So here's the thing. I just, after the first two games of the series, I'm like, dang, the Mavs are going to do it. Like up to, oh, this isn't going to happen. And then the Clippers came back and won those two. And I'm like, okay, are the Mavs, you know, kind of losing their fire and are the Clippers kind of getting back in it? And then you have a couple more games to make it three and three. I just feel more confident in saying the Clippers just because I struggle thinking that Kawhi Leonard um, is going to struggle this game. And that, I mean, I think I will see success from Paul George and I don't know if Luca will be able to pull the Mavs through one more game, but I honestly don't know. Like whatever outcome happens, like, like that's how evenly matched this series really has been. Like I would pick the Clippers probably even take a bet on them at six and a half over just because of how fouls work down the stretch. But I don't, yeah, I, I, I just I would lean clips, but the Mavs wouldn't surprise me. It's just been such an evenly matched series. Yeah, I I don't I I'm actually leaning Mavs and that might be me being biased. <laughs> uh but I from and I haven't watched a ton of actual gameplay in this series, so my analysis may be a little skewed, but I do think um I don't think the Clippers have really figured out how to stop it. And the only reason the Clippers won last night is just because the Mavs weren't hitting open shots down the stretch. Yeah, they were getting good shots that they just weren't falling. So if that happens again, or um, if the Clippers offense is just on point like it was, or or Kawhi Leonard's offense was on point like it was last game, uh, then I could like it's it's definitely a toss up. Like either team could pull it out. But I feel like the Mavs aren't going to let that happen two games in a row, but it, it may turn into like a, a James Harden Rockets versus Golden State Warriors game seven, where just the Mavs n- come out, they're getting their shots. They're just not dropping all night. So uh, like you said, it is kind of a toss up. Yeah. So Luca last night only scored 29 um, and Tim Hardaway Jr. had 23. So if Luca scores 40 plus and another Mavs player gets 20, then I think the Mavs win. I, I, he needs someone to get 20 like Hardaway did last night, but you're probably, you're going to need Luca to score at least 35 plus, if not 40. Yeah. He, he needs to be aggressive. And I feel like yeah. last night he wasn't in the fourth quarter uh, because he, he was trying to get the team involved. Which well, and back to game five, I mean, should. he had 40 points going into the, going into the fourth quarter and he ended the game with 42 points. So I don't know if that's an overall theme. If we looked into it, that his fourth quarters have been really mediocre this year, um, this series, but it, it'll be an exciting game. I'm excited to watch that game tomorrow and we're, we're excited to see who the jazz are going to get in the second round. I think they can be either team. Um, if the Clippers all of a sudden, you know, meshed and caught fire, I'd be really concerned about where that was going to go. But like you've said, they haven't done it and it's possible, but I mean, after the last two, after the last few playoff rounds, should we expect the Clippers to ever be anything better is really just the the overarching question. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, on this channel, I've noticed we talk almost exclusively about the Western Conference, which it, it, it makes sense what we're, we're focused on the jazz. Yeah. Um, and, and so I bet a lot of people are, are wanting to hear our takes on on the Lakers losing. I'm just going to like let you know right now, like, like let you know right now. We'll just skip that. There's thousands of videos about the Lakers because that's what everyone <laughs> wants to talk about. We don't need to be another p- another channel talking about the Lakers. So, uh, for the last little bit of this video, let's actually hop over to the Eastern Conference. So Obviously, what you're saying, Dale, just just to make sure before we get to this Easter egg, is instead of talking about the team with the second most number of NBA championships, we're going to talk about the team with the with the most NBA championships <laughs> in the Boston Celtics and what we think about also Dan Gage lost and in Brad the first Stevens. Round. <laughs> um, 
So we're going to talk a bit more about Danny Ainge overall because of there's some Utah rumors circulating around there. Um, personally, though, when I got the news that Brad Stevens, I originally thought Brad Stevens was moving to the general manager of the Celtics, but no, he is moving to the president of basketball operations from a head coaching gig. And he's been head coaching for less than a decade. It is such a bad move in my opinion that there's part of me that expects it to work because I can't imagine Danny Ainge appointing his successor who would be as terrible as I think Brad Stevens is going to be. Like, I almost feel like I'm almost like, is he just like some virtuoso who's going to go out and just do an amazing job finding players? Like, What's going on? Is this a Celtics ploy where Danny Ainge is actually still working there, <laughs> but people will do trade trades with Brad Stevens versus just ignoring requests from um, Danny Ainge? Like, what is going on here? I don't know what you think about Stevens moving up. Uh, I I've liked him as a coach until recently, obviously when they had the talent to win and they just didn't. Yeah. And and there's a lot of talk about that. Like he just kind of lost control of the team, which is is a sign that like. I still think he's an awesome basketball mind. He just maybe he's not the best to coach superstars. So I, and and he said himself like he's kind of uh, he he's not as excited about coaching as he used to be. Um, I I think it's just a question mark about how he'll perform in the front office. Obviously, he knows basketball very very well. Yeah, so he has that going for him, but uh, it takes a different skill like knowing basketball is nice but it takes a different skill set to really put together an awesome team um as as a because he'll be doing that, that's the thing that most people will be watching is his general manager kind of stuff yeah, um, yeah i mean but, he like if the celtics don't make it to an nba finals in the next seven eight years like that will be disappointing like you have Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. Um, you have all of your draft picks. Like you have been put up in a really good situation, even though, yeah, a- there were some mistakes Ainge made. But at the very minimum, it's not like you're strapped for assets. Yeah. So, do, like, th- this is a little bit off of the Danny Ainge topic that we wanted to focus on. But do you think Brad Stevens is going to go and start trading their draft picks? Because it's not like their Ooh. draft picks are terribly valuable. And if they trade them, they could get... Because they have... Like you said, they have Kimba, who's like not really been playing to yeah. his max contract. He's still good, though. Um, you have Jason Tatum, who is really on the verge of being a superstar. And you have Jalen Brown, who just showed that he's a legit all-star. Uh, not like a borderline all-star this year. And so, But other than that, they really don't have... A great roster. They have a couple have of Marcus okay pieces, Smart, but who you can probably get some stuff for in a trade. Um, you have Forsett, I think. Oh no, Fournier. 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 Um, yeah. You have you have Evan Fournier, who has not been who you wanted him to be, but you can still probably say like, look, he just didn't work well on our system, and try to leverage that to get some decent stuff out of it. So there's definitely a lot of play and. You want it. I mean, the East isn't good enough for Boston not to be a top four seed. Like the Knicks and Hawks are not good enough that Boston shouldn't have got. I mean, Boston should have got that seed. Like maybe Miami, you could argue, and they did have a COVID riddled season. But like Boston should be four or five. Like, yeah, okay. they should be able to get there. Because um, honestly, it- and this might be a little bit of disrespect to some of the players on the Mavs, but I feel like the roster with the Mavs and the Celtics are really similar, except for the Celtics have two stars oh. and the Mavs really just have one. Yeah. And and so like, I feel like, and the Mavs only having one star, granted Luke is probably better than Jason Tatum, but he also has Jalen Brown. So do you think that I feel the, like the Celtics um, should be higher, especially since the West is tougher. Do you think they should move away from trying to get, you know, that third star or like have those big names? Do you think they should stop trying to go after the Horfords and the Haywards and the Irvings and, you know, the Walkers and just build around Brown and Tatum? Yeah, I, I, I like that would another yeah. superstar is not really going to help them because they don't have like we the Jazz are so good 
because they have a superstar and their bench is awesome. Yeah. The Celtics aren't good because they don't have any bench. Like if if they don't have their starting lineup and they're just losing points and then their starters are always trying to fight from behind. So I no, that, that's my opinion. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. No, um and you do definitely need to find a solid point guard. I can't remember what Jalen position Jalen Brown plays. He's but, like a big small forward. Yeah. And, so and they're playing Jason Tatum at power forward, but he's yeah. really more of a small forward as well. So if you got someone who is a bit more dedicated to ball handling, that would help. But let's get to the Utah angle. Um, sorry, I totally took us down that rabbit hole on. Do you want Danny Ainge to have any relationship with the Jazz? And I have my answer on it. And I'm not sure if you have any really formulated opinion on it, but he's a BYU guy. I mean, he's the second. He has one of the most iconic runs. Him and um, Jimmer Fredette, like, they led the team to the Elite Eight. I'm pretty sure I have my facts right there. Like, he has a lot of state connections. And, I mean, it's kind of been floating around in rumors, so I don't know how you feel about that overall. Um, I'll answer a different question first. Okay. But I think it would be awesome if he came and, like, was an assistant coach for BYU. Okay, I, I, I think, think, I mean, yeah, that I would be awesome. I think that would be a ton of fun. Um, I don't know... How, how how much he'd love coaching but as far as the jazz i would i would be okay with him coming and joining the front office i wouldn't want him take like he would have to take a backseat role though because i yeah. think the jazz have a good front office and i don't think Ainge is good enough to to replace him like replace any of our major front office pieces he yeah. could come in as like an assistant gm kind of role yeah. and and help out because i think he he has a good he knows how to spot talent. He knows how to spot the talent that is that you can trade for. And the Jazz really haven't been a team that has traded a ton, which has worked for them. But if you can add that into their strategy a little bit more, uh, like that's how we got Jordan Clarkson. So if we can get some good trades that could even boost the Jazz, I just wouldn't want him being the main guy. Oh, okay. Um, I, you know, you said the Jordan Clarkson trade. I do have to remind everyone that the Jazz traded for Donovan Mitchell and traded for Rudy Gobert. Uh, it's yeah, not a midseason that, trade. Yeah. So, like, I totally get where that was what it comes down to. It was a draft night trade. But mm -hmm. the Jazz really have done something like your two best players and the best defensive player in the league right now came from trades. And obviously Denver's not crying over it. <laughs> I mean, well, they've got Jamal Murray, they've got Porter Jr., and I mean, they've got Jokic. But I feel like a lot of people just look at the fact that the Jazz don't do offseason trades, and are like, the Jazz need to trade more. But when you look at it, it's not like teams that do midseason trades have a lot of success. Like, they, they, it's always just a big risk, you know, mm -hmm. and you have to move a lot of pieces. And the way that Quinn Snyder's team is built is bringing someone in, in the middle of the year, like isn't exactly great. Jordan basically just does whatever he wants and that's why it works. But like to, tr I mean, we saw how long it took Mike Conley to like learn the jazz system last year. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't really know how I feel about those midseason trades. My biggest concern, and whether or not this is true, what's been floated around the league a lot, and I've heard, is that people do not like trading with Danny Ainge. Like, he has made so many people look like a fool. He made the Timberwolves look like a fool when he got Kevin Garnett. He made the Nets look like a fool when he got the draft picks that I believe would eventually become Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. Um, like, he has definitely um, like made a lot of great moves. And because of that, he's almost a victim of his own success in some ways. Like people are just like, so, so what am I missing when I look at this trade? So if anything, I'd maybe want, if the most I'd want him to ever be is a consultant, like that just kind of did whatever he wanted to, when he wanted to. Yeah. Um, and he just didn't and have I'd any probably, say in making the call. Yeah, I'd probably just prefer not at all just because of my concern. Like, will that create an environment where other players don't want where other teams don't want to deal with Utah? And maybe that's not the case. Maybe that's all just overblown. And it's just because some moves fell through due to reasons out of his control. Yeah. And 
And to kind of counter that, like he did have an offer from, and, and this is the rumor, I don't know how accurate this is. He had an offer for Gordon Hayward where he would have gotten Miles Turner and like another piece, I forget who it was. And he said no to it because he wanted either Miles Turner and TJ Warren or Miles Turner and Victor Oladipo. Yeah. And, and the Pacers said no. And so like, He's still getting like if he made that trade like Miles Turner on the Celtics like they lost Gordon Hayward anyway so that could have helped him a ton this season. Um, so I feel like he's still like when he has a piece to move he still can find the trade. It's just he tries to look so much out of it that he kind of burned himself there by saying no yeah. to that. Well, another rumor I heard and this one uh, again regarding Indiana and I think this one might be more confirmed and this wasn't necessarily his fault. Maybe it was kind of the milking it, like you said. Apparently, he had a deal set up to ink Paul George to get him traded instead of to Boston instead of OKC. And he said, OK, just just give me a minute. Like, we're going to get Gordon Hayward from Utah. Um, He's going to sign with us, which makes me wonder what kind of tampering was going on there if he was that confident. <laughs> like, but let me sign him to a max deal and then I can trade for Paul George and it can all be cap clean. It can all work in the cap, but it couldn't work out that way. Um, now, and like we, we commented, like, do the Celtics have too many stars, but they wouldn't have got Kyrie in that scenario. So imagine Isaiah Thomas, Paul George, Gordon Hayward, um, Jay, Jason Tatum, I believe at that point, um, like just, Thice or someone and like Thice, just that would be crazy. And there, Paul George has some issues and we'll see if he gets things cleaned up in the playoffs this year and, or like where he goes with his legacy. There's definitely some um, you know, some trash that people talk there, but he's definitely, he definitely goes big. He goes for those home run hits. And frankly, maybe I'm just really conservative when it comes to trades as a jazz fan. I, I don't really want that for Utah. I, I don't think it works well in our system and with our organization, but if he was consulting, I wouldn't have too big of a problem with that. I just, I mean, like we've said multiple times, Lindsay and Zanuck are some of the best front office people in the NBA. And there's even more people who, you know, I don't know their names who do an amazing job. Like the jazz have done a really good job getting to where they are now with their front office. And because of that, I, I I'm happy with where we're at. And I don't feel like we need Ainge to take it, take any significant role for the jazz to be successful. So end of the day, he should go back to BYU. That's what you're saying. <laughs> I would love that. I think that him going back to BYU would be awesome. Um, I mean, you don't do trades. You kind of do now with the transfer portal, but that's, that's another story <laughs> that's entirely. Weird. So, all right. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. Let us know if you want to face the Clippers or the Mavs um, as a Jazz fan. And also, uh, um, sorry, for scatterbrain. Also, um, if the games happened, if after game seven, let us know your thoughts on the upcoming opponents. So thanks again and go Jazz.